Good morning, church. It's good to be here. It's good to be here and share. It's good to be here and sing. It's good to be here and be a community, a family together. And it's awesome. Yeah, thank you, everyone who's been a part, who's been involved. Thank you, Robin, for your prayer. It's beautiful that we can share life together and share life's moments with each other. I don't know if any of you have also been sharing in something else this morning, and that is our enthusiastic fan team that are sitting over there. How many of you felt welcomed when they came in? How many of you felt, yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. If you haven't noticed, we're on a bit of a fan theme this morning. And as Karen pointed out, we're having probably the biggest event of the weekend is the Wellington Sevens, where more than 30,000 people are going to descend on the cake tin in Wellington in all different kinds of costumes and dress. And we have some photos from previous years that we're going to throw up and just have you look at. Fan paradise, great outfits, quick, fast action on the rugby field, even though most people there probably don't even see it and a great atmosphere, a great vibe. And we look at this and we think, yeah, that would be great. This, would, this is awesome. We'd love to get in the costumes and cheer and be a part of that. And it takes us back to our own fan moments. Because I'm sure in a group like this, most of us, if not all of us, are fans of something or someone. Maybe you're a fan of the Breakers. How many of you are fans of the Breakers? Okay, the Warriors, any Warrior fans with us? The Silver Ferns, Lydia Ko, any of you fans of Lydia Ko? Maybe Valerie Adams, Scott Dixon, the Phoenix soccer team, the All Blacks. Okay, I think that's a prerequisite for residency here in New Zealand. <laughs> You've got to be a fan of the All Blacks. Maybe it's not sport, maybe it's music, maybe you're a fan of a band. Any One Direction fans in here? I know we've got a few. Or, or TV drama or a movie or even people. A lot of us maybe are fans of people. We get fans. We understand. We know what it means to be a fan. There was a girl many years ago that I was a fan of. And uh, just a... Disclaimer, this was many years ago. This fan that I'm talking about, or who I was a fan of, it was not Liz. If Liz was on the picture, this poor lady would have had no show because of Liz's charm and beauty. But this was, back in my high school years, I was a fan of this one girl. And it was great. We, we, we got into kind of a relationship. She lived in Taranaki. I went to school at LAC down in Palmerston North. And so we'd mainly see each other on weekends and we'd have some good times exploring Taranaki and just, yeah, having a great time together. And so we were in, I guess you'd call it a relationship. She was my girlfriend. And all her friends kind of would whisper in my ear whenever they got around me, they're like, Norman, you know that she's really into you. You know that she really likes you. And I guess maybe the reason why they were telling me that or why that would maybe put me at or, yeah, just make me feel a bit uncomfortable because I wasn't quite sure yet. I was in this whole relationship between us, you know, I knew she was really into me and I wasn't quite sure yet, but I enjoyed spending time with her, I enjoyed the company, so I didn't want to go there in terms of, you know, the discussions or questions. So when the, her friends would tell me, Norman, she's really into you, I'd be like, yeah, 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 whatever, and then I'd go back to LAC for the week and then come back on the weekends and it was all good. So there was kind of this fuzzy zone that the relationship was in. Then um, one day, or it came up to the summer break, and friends of ours phoned us and said, hey, they're coming out from South Africa, they want to come into a bit of New Zealand, can we maybe take them around New Zealand a bit? Now, I still don't know to this day what my dad was thinking, but me being 16, my brothers only 18, and these friends of ours who came over, I think they were in between the ages of six, 15 and 17, he gave us the family van and said, go and tour New Zealand. 
don't know what he was thinking. Crazy idea. He must have trusted us. But it was all good because that was probably one of, still to this day, one of my most memorable holidays as we toured around North Island, South Island, and we did it really cheap. We basically didn't book in any backpackers or, or any hotels or motels on the way. We'd go down and try and find someone we knew in a town where we'd go and stay. Like, I know we slept in some churches around the place. We'd just go to the pastor, knock on the door, hey, can we, we had sleeping bags, so we'd camp out there. We slept next to the lake at Rotorua in a cave down in Dunedin. And it was some, one time we even just met people on the street and they welcomed us to their home. So it was great. One of those awesome awesome holidays, but there's one thing I neglected to do during that holiday, and that was call my girlfriend, who was back in Taranaki. I think we're, down, we're having touring for a month, and that whole month, I didn't get in contact with her at all. And so I came back from the holiday, and of course, went to catch up with her, and I was telling her about all the fun times we had, how awesome it was, and for some other reason, she wasn't quite sharing my excitement about it all and my enthusiasm with it. And then it came about time for me to go, and I think the parents had called, hey, you should be home by now, so I was on my way out. And just as I was on our way out, she said, Norman, we need to talk. And I kind of knew where this was going. I kind of knew that this was the, Norman, we need to talk. We need to define this relationship. We need to have that awkward, uncomfortable talk where we need to assess where we at. Where's this whole thing at? Where's this relationship going to go from here? Let's define the relationship. I've labeled it for the sermon, the DTR talk. Define the relationship talk. Luckily, parents had called, so I was out of there pretty quick. Didn't have to have the talk then. And I avoided her for the next few days. But she cornered me at church. Okay, we're at the church and she cornered me and she said, look, we need to have that talk. And true enough, the talk was, Norman, we need to define this relationship. Okay, I I'm, I'm, want to be committed to you. I want to, you know, maybe go deep, whatever that means. But where are you at? Where are you at with all of this? And sadly, because you see, when I, when I look back and reflect on it, I was, I was being pretty selfish. I was being pretty selfish in this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so... At that time, you know, we, when, when all the chips were on the table, I said, yep, no, I'm probably not as committed yet. Still want to be your friend, still want to get to know you, but I'm, yeah, not quite where you are in terms of the whole relationship. And so that's where the relationship ended. But if we didn't have that DTR talk, the relationship wasn't going to improve, was probably going to deteriorate, and someone was ultimately going to get, I know someone was hurt in the process anyway, but someone was going to get even more hurt because the relationship hadn't been defined. Or one person in that relationship wasn't really committed, wasn't really, was maybe just a fan, not really committed. And you see, these DTR talks, they are they necessary, they're important. Because as I said, they help relationships move. They help relationships grow maybe deeper or to the next level. They help relationships move from where they are to the next place, away from the status quo. Over the next several weeks, I want us to examine or do a bit of a DTR, define our relationship when it comes to Jesus. Now, I get that for some of you, this is kind of a first date. For some of you, maybe you're, you're new here and you're not quite sure what this is all about. You've never really interacted, and so this might be too soon. We all know those dates when on the first date and someone asks, hey, can I marry you? It's like, whoa, no, no, stop. <laughs> okay, so maybe for some of you, this is a first date, and that's cool, we get that. We're glad you're here. We love having you here. And yeah, not wanting to pressure you into anything really. But um, for a lot of us in here, this, this isn't the first date. For a lot of us in here, we've, we've been around a while. And maybe it is time, maybe it is time to have that DTR talk when it comes to Jesus. We need to define the relationship. You see, Christ's invitation to us, Jesus' invitation in Luke, he, it's in the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, verse 23. This is on page... 
6.22 in the Bible in the seat pocket in front of you if you want to have a look. Christ's invitation to us, when he's talking about how he wants to look at or his premise for a relationship with us is this. He says, and this, here he's talking to the crowd, and he says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If any of you wants to be my follower, turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily. Another way he says that in another version, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. What is interesting, whenever Jesus was in a crowd, whenever Jesus was in a crowd, probably a crowd this size or maybe a crowd even bigger, Jesus never shied away from the DTR talks. See, for some of you, me asking that, or, or Jesus even saying that, makes you uncomfortable. Your palms start sweating, you start getting palpitations, and you're wondering, looking where the closest exit is, because these DDR talks are scary. Defining the relationship is sometimes scary, especially for men. Men, I get this. Okay, please don't run on me here. But Jesus never shied away from these opportunities. Whenever he was in a crowd even bigger than this, often he would make a comment or he would ask a question that was targeted at defining the relationship, challenging the status quo of whoever was following. He wanted to find out why, why are you here? What is this all about? And so because Jesus didn't shy away from it, here at the beginning of 2014, as we set course on the year that is as our church, I want us to maybe just take the time and just take stock in the next few weeks and let's define the relationship. Let's ask ourselves some tough questions. And the first one I'm going to ask today is this. Sitting here today talking about Jesus and our relationship with Jesus, are you a fan or are you a follower of Jesus? Are you a fan or are you a follower of Jesus? Now, please don't jump to your answer too quickly. I want us to explore the difference before you answer this question. So, just to help us understand definitions, a fan or how we're describing a fan, a fan is an enthusiastic admirer. Those guys there, they're fans. They're enthusiastic admirers. Okay, now's your time, guys. Go, yeah. They're enthusiastic admirers. And as we pointed out, we're all fans of different things. We get it when it comes to sports. We understand. We watch the games. We cheer. Some of us even have the jerseys and we know the players' names and we, we buy the cards or we do whatever. We're fans of sports. But what can be scary, and this is the scary reality, is that church has the potential to easily become a stadium full of fans of Jesus. But Jesus never cared much about having fans. He never wanted fans. He never worried about popularity. He was not trying to get more likes on Facebook or, or Tumblr or more followers in the Twitter kind of way. If you define a fan as an enthusiastic admirer, Jesus was not concerned about getting fans. It's not what he was after. Often what happens in this building every Saturday, every week, could be considered fan-like activity. Think about it. We all arrive, we come, we take our seats, we read through the handouts, we stand at the right time, clap at the right time, sit at the right time. Many of us then, after leaving here, we somehow think that this was all for us. And as we're leaving, we evaluate what happened. You know, we assess, was the speaker okay? You know, was the sermon good? Was it fine? What about the song choice? Was it no, thumbs up, thumbs down? Often what happens here could seem or look like or be considered fan-like activity. And for some of us, we come back and do that week after week. And I get the fact that some of you are really big fans. I mean, you're really into all of this. You know the songs, you don't need the page numbers when you, when you turn to the pages of the Bible, you know where to turn, you're big fans of Jesus, and being a fan feels pretty good. We think Jesus is a good guy, 
But we can easily forget that Jesus was never concerned about having fans. But if we're honest with ourselves and we really search our hearts over the next few weeks, we'll begin to define the relationship where we stand with Jesus. And today I'm going to ask three questions to help us define that relationship. And here's the first one. Why are you here? Only you can answer this for yourself. Why are you here? Really? As I mentioned, when we read through the Gospels, Jesus often, when he spoke to the crowds, didn't shy away from these hard, awkward, define the relationship comments and conversations. And we're going to look at one of those examples as we read together this morning. This is in John chapter 6. Please feel free to turn to the Bible in the seat pocket in front of you. John chapter 6. It's not going to be up on the board, so if you follow, want to follow along, page 641. We're looking at the question, why are you here? Let's define this relationship. We'll start reading from verse 22. So John chapter 6, start reading from verse 22. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the far shore saw that the disciples had taken the only boat and they realized that Jesus had not gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the, the bread the people had eaten. Okay, I want to stop there. I want to pause. Verse 22 starts off with, and the next day. It's assuming something happened before. And it even mentions here, the day before the people had eaten bread. Okay? Let me just put us in context what happened. The day before Jesus had arrived, a large crowd, they reckon more than 5,000 people, that's not including women and children, and at some point, the disciples came to Jesus and said, hey, these guys are getting hungry. The crowd's getting hungry. We need to do something. So Jesus looked at Philip and said, well, feed them. And they were like, hey, it would take more than, I don't know how many weeks, months, wages to try to get enough money to feed all these people. There's no way we can do it. So then, or Jesus said that to Andrew. So then Philip brings a basket to Jesus. In the basket is five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus takes what Philip had brought. He says a blessing over it. And he tells his disciples, take the food and hand it out to the crowd. After everyone in the crowd had eaten their fill, there's like 12 baskets and I don't know how many of bread, I don't know how many baskets of fish, can't remember, left over. You can read this in, in chapter 6 this morning or this afternoon when you go home. So this is what had happened the day before. Here the crowd sitting, there's no food, there's no money, there's no, all of them are hungry, and Jesus says a prayer over the bread and fishes, and everyone eats to their fill. This is more than possibly 10,000 people. Do you, do you get that? Can you get your head around that? This is what they've witnessed. But then the crowd starts pushing Jesus. They start saying, hey, Jesus, we want you to be our king. Look at what you can do. If you can do this, imagine we can have an army out in the battlefield and you can feed all of them. No worries. You just like say a blessing over it and there's no worries. And they say, Jesus, we want you to be our king. You be our leader. Jesus tells his disciples, get in the boat, go over to the other side of the shore. The crowd sees the disciples get in the boat, go over to the other side of the shore. But here it says in verse 22, they still on this side of the shore and they didn't see Jesus get in the boat with the disciples. Then they know the disciples have gone and taken the only boat, but Jesus hadn't. So now they're looking for Jesus. What we read before the story as well is the story where Jesus walks on the water. Many of you might know that, many of you might not. Go read it this afternoon, John chapter 6. Because in the night, while the disciples were on the water, storm came up, Jesus walks on the water to the disciples, amazing thing, things happen, they end up on the other side of the shore. This has all happened, and now we read in verse 22, the people, they're looking for Jesus. Verse 23, several boats from Tiberias had landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. And they found him on the other side of the lake and asked, 
Rabbi, when did you get here? So they, they find him and they're like, no, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. You were with us. You were here on this side of the lake like just the other day and we saw the disciples leave. You didn't leave. Now you're here. When did you get here? How did this happen? Jesus replied. Now note what Jesus says. This is, okay. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. Jesus doesn't waste any time, does he? The crowd arrives, they find him. He's like, Jesus says, you want to be with me because I fed you. Immediately, he says, let's define this relationship right here, okay? We're not going to waste time. Let's define this relationship. You're, you're after me because I fed you, aren't you? Why are you really here? Why are you here? They replied, verse 28, or sorry, verse 27. This is still Jesus talking. But don't be concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. I love it. It says, I know why you're here. You're here because you're after what you can get from me. You're after food. But he says, stop spending your time chasing perishable things. Seek me. Seek me who God has sent and who God has given his approval to. Seek more of me because that is where you will find what you're looking for and be satisfied. He says, let's be clear about what this is. I don't want fans. I'm not after people who are going to be like, oh, Jesus did this. No, I want people who want to come because they want to know God and they want to know me, the one God sent, Jesus Christ. So the crowd respond. Verse 28. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus, we want to be like you. We want to do these miracles. We want to perform God's works. What should we do? In verse 29, Jesus told them, this is the only work my father wants from you. Believe in the one who he has sent. I'm going to read that again. This is the only work my father wants from you. Believe in the one who he has sent. Believe in me, Jesus Christ. That is all that God wants you to do. And verse 30, they answer, Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? Jesus cut straight to the chase. Let's define this relationship. Let's not beat around the bush. Why are you here? And here it comes out exactly why the crowd was following him. Why? Jesus, we want to see what you can do. We want to see what you can do for us. Before we believe in you, Jesus, before we follow you, before we make a commitment, before we, we are here because we want to see what you can do for us. That's why we're here. Jesus cuts right to the chase. He carries on talking. We're not going to read that. He carries on talking and he says some crazy stuff. Even when you read it today, you're like, what? What are you saying? Just as an example, he says like, eat my flesh and, and drink my blood. Okay? It's like, what? That's crazy. And even today, it's, you know, we're like, what are you actually trying to say there? But Jesus immediately goes and calls for a deeper commitment. He immediately goes and calls out those that are just fans and those that are truly willing to be followers. And it says in verse 66 that from this moment, many of his disciples said, this is very hard for us to understand how can we Accepted. That's verse 60, not 66. Verse 66. This point, many of his disciples turned away 
and deserted him. Verse 67, then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, are you also going to leave? Why are you here? What is your because? Like the people, because Jesus, we want to see what you can do for us. We want to see you do awesome miracles and feed us again. We want what you can offer. That's why we're here. But the question this morning I'm asking you is, why are you here? What is your because? Is it because you like the free food at some of the lunches? Hey, it's great. It's awesome. Is it because the seats are comfortable? My armchair at home isn't quite the same. I don't know. Or you really like the music? Is it because you like the chit-chat? Your kids can make friends easier than at school? Or you like this community? Why, why are you here? All of that is great for a while, and you're always welcome. I want you to know, I'm, I'm being quite harsh and direct this morning, but I want you to know you're always welcome, but honestly, at some point, we need to define the relationship. Why are you here? In the passage, Jesus challenges the fans to go deeper, more intimate, closer relationship, greater commitment. And it says many of them turned and weren't willing to follow him. There could be some of you sitting here today thinking, hey, if this preacher guy keeps on pushing this button, I'm out of here. And if that is, if that's you, that's okay. We get it. We know that sometimes this is uncomfortable, but know that you're still welcome here. And this is a journey. But let's define what we've got here. Is it God who you want? Is it Jesus who you're after? Or have you come because you want to get something out of it? Do you come because the miracles are good? Do you come because there's something that you want? Why are you here? What is your because? I ask myself this question. For Jesus, why does he come? We believe and we teach and we say that he gathers here. He's with us every week. He's with us every time. He's with us every moment of the day, but he especially, and we just sang and prayed, Holy Spirit, come, be welcome here. Why does Jesus come? He shows up and he invites us. His because is that he wants us to grow in a deeper relationship with him. He wants you. He wants all of you. He doesn't want what you have. He doesn't want what you can do. He wants you. Which brings us to the next question we're going to ask in defining this relationship this morning. Are you all in? Are you all in? Because you see, being a follower of Jesus requires complete commitment. A follower of Jesus will do whatever it takes. They're absolutely loyal and they're committed. On the whole, I personally, and I'm speaking from personal experience now, as a whole, I don't feel we do this very well, this completely committed, this whole commitment thing as Christians today. See, what happens is, is we become very selective. We customize our Christianity. Oftentimes, we look at our relationship with Jesus and we say, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. Yep, I'll follow you. But I'll kind of pick and choose the areas in which I want to follow you. You say, well, I'll follow Jesus, but just don't ask me to forgive that person. Just don't ask me to let go of this hurt. This, just don't ask me to let, no, don't ask me to forgive that person. I'll follow you, Jesus, but just don't ask me to do that. Or some of us say, you know what, I'll follow you, Jesus. Yep, I'll become a completely committed follower. I'm all in, but <laughs> just don't touch my money. Okay, Jesus, I work hard for that. Don't, please, just don't tell me what to do with my money. For some of us, like, yep, Jesus, I'll follow. I will, I'll follow you, no worries. But when it comes to those sexual desires, when I can't help that, or, or, or Jesus, I'm, I'm not going to 
Don't tell me what to do with it. Don't tell me to abstain. I'll follow you, but just, just don't touch that one. I'm a follower of Jesus, but it won't stop me from getting what I want. And it's this customized Christianity that says we'll follow, but only in the areas that are comfortable to us, God. Only in the areas that I agree with. I'm a Christian, but I'm not all in. What Jesus highlights to us in the story is, well, well, then you're a fan. You're not a follower. It's not an option to be selective or have selective commitment. It's not a possibility. There's no bargaining. There's no bartering. There's no ifs or buts or ums. It's, are you all in? Have you decided to be a follower of Christ? Why are you here? Are you all in? And the third one I want to quickly ask you this morning is have you made it your own? Have you made it your own? Many of us start going to church because maybe our parents tell us to come. This is especially to the youngsters. If you're in your teens or, or maybe you're a youth among us, this question is particularly pertinent. Many of us are here because our parents brought us, because it's, we grew up in it, it's tradition. Or maybe you started coming because of a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse. You come because they like it when you come. You come to appease them. For those of us who grew up in church or who attend church in order to appease a significant other, it can be really easy to become a fan. I know this because I've been there. In high school at Longburn Adventist College, a particular interaction has haunted me ever since it happened when I was, I think I was sixth form, what's that, year 12, in the dorms there at Longburn. <clears throat> and I had some Taiwanese friends. And we were busy sitting late one night. I was sitting in their dorm room about 9.30, busy eating noodles because the three helpings of cafeteria food two hours earlier obviously weren't enough. And we're busy eating noodles with them in their room and I'll never forget, that they turned to me, we're talking about a whole bunch of stuff, and they turned to me and said, Norman, Norman, all this stuff, they like going to church like God and like that they teach us here and I'm, you know, they take us off to church. Do you really believe all of that? Do you really believe that? And I look back now and I'm like, Whoa, what an opportunity, what an awesome moment. Here you get someone like just openly, and this was in a good relational context, someone saying, hey, what do you believe? What is this God thing all about? Yes, this is your moment to share and tell them all about this awesome God, what he's done for you and, and how you believe in him and how he's made such a difference in your life. But the words that came out of my mouth, they're like, Norman, do you believe all of this? Are you? And I'm like, nah. I was like, nah, not, not really. My parents, I guess, I grew up going to church. I grew up going to church, and my parents just, it's just stuff we've done all our life, and I guess here yeah, I'm at this college, so I've got to go along. So, nah, I don't really. And I don't know what else we spoke about that night, but the conversation moved on. But as I lay in bed that night, <clears throat> their question and my response haunted me. And I'm like, was that really true? Was that true, Norman? Do you really not believe this? Is this just something that your parents, is, what, is, what is this? And right there that night as I was wrestling with how I responded, almost instinctively to their question, it started my journey of truth started my journey of seeking God and actually asking, well, have I made this my own? Is this something that I really believe? And in my journey of seeking truth, 
It took a while, but God was patient. And I know now, and I trust now, and I believe now, and I come not because of tradition or heritage or or guilt or because I'm paid to, but because I've tasted and seen for myself that God is good. And I want more, more of Him. Whatever it takes, whatever that costs, I'm all in. It's my own. I've made it my own. And so that's the question we're posing to you today. Your faith. Have you made it your own? So as we begin this search the next few weeks, as we ask, are you all in? Are you a follower of Jesus or are you just a fan? We're going to continue asking, why are you here? Are you all in? Have you made it your own? Our worship team is going to come up and sing the song we learned in the beginning. And today, if you're ready to say yes, if you want to be a follower, and, or maybe you have chosen already to be a follower and you want to declare and just say, yes, I am. Lord, I am all in. Maybe, maybe you've been a, f- a fan for a long while, and as we've been talking about it, as you've been deciding, answering that question, am I a fan or a follower? You're like, you know what, Jesus? Actually, if I have to be honest and evaluate, I'm maybe sitting in the fan zone right now. But you want to be a follower. You want to make that decision. You want to make that commitment. Then in response, I'll invite you to sing along. Sing along to the song we're going to sing. And you can do that however you choose. If you want to stand, stand. If you want to sit, stay sitting. If you want to kneel, kneel. But declare it, sing along. You want to be a follower. But if you're not ready, or maybe you're not yet sure, you're you're here, but that's as far as it goes. Maybe you haven't made it your own yet, or you don't even know where to start. You don't even know how. If that's where you are, I want to encourage you to please just tap the next person next to you on the shoulder. Just talk to any church member here and just ask them, what does that mean? What does that look like? How do I become a follower? And if that's too scary, if that's too hard, in the seat pocket in front of you are little cards that look like this. Little cards that look like this and there's a little box you can tick that says, I want to know more about becoming a follower of Jesus. And if that's you, then just write your name and address there and we'll be in contact with you. And we can talk to you about it and and walk you through what it means and what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. But then if you're here and you've been a part of us today and you've been offended by this whole define the relationship talk, you're not wanting to make a decision now, then that's okay. Don't feel like you have to sing. But please know that you're welcome. Keep coming. You're still welcome here. And we'd love to see you again. And, but as we go this, these next few weeks, we're going to urge you to consider these questions. Only because we know that God loves you. He wants to go on a life-changing journey with you if you will let Him. If you will allow Him. If you will come to know Him. If you will seek Him. So why are you here? What is your motivation this morning? Jesus wants it to be Him. Are you all in? Are you willing to commit? Are you willing to give it your all? Because that's when it's the best. And have you made made it your own? Is this your choice? Because you've seen and because you know God. As you consider these, join us as we sing.